So good evening, everybody. I'm absolutely delighted to welcome uh, Sally Hayden to join us here at the Global Health Conference in Dublin. Um, Sally Hayden is an award-winning journalist and photographer focused on migration, on human rights and humanitarian crisis. Her book, My Fourth Time We Drowned, Seeking Refuge on the World's Deadliest Migration Route, won the 2022 Orwell Prize for Political Writing and the Michelle Dion Prize. Sally is currently the Africa correspondent for the Irish Times, and she has also worked with Vice News, with CNN International, the Financial Times, Time, BBC, the Washington Post, The Guardian, the New York Times, Channel 4 News, and many others. Sally was also included on the Forbes 30 under 30 list for media in Europe. Sally, you are so welcome, and thank you for joining us from, uh, from, from Sierra Leone, where you are today. Um, you're, you're very welcome. Thank you so much for having me. So I wonder if we could start um, with just a reading from you, Sally, from, uh, from such a powerful book, if, if you would be so kind as just to, uh, to share something, something that, you know, something of, of the prologue perhaps with us. Yeah, sure. I just figured reading the prologue, a bit of the prologue makes sense because it kind of sets up the idea for the book. Um, what does your phone mean to you? Is it a way to chat to friends or swipe through dating apps? Do you take selfies, send voice notes or Snapchats? Is it a vital source of information? Has it saved your life? What would it represent if you were incarcerated? It's little screen, your only window to the outside world. What would it be like to spend months or years in the same building without one? Could you share a phone with 500 others? Would you risk being tortured to keep it or forego eating to buy data? knowing you would starve without food, but could disappear forever if you had no way of sending a distress call? What was it like to watch innocent people being shot through Facebook Messenger? How would you feel listening to their faltering voices as they mentally and physically withered away? That's what I was going to discover. Originally, I believed these first contacts in Libya were an anomaly, the isolated victims of an accidental oversight. Once these people were helped, I thought my job would be done. I was wrong. Within days, more and more detained refugees began contacting me. They got my number from friends or found what I had been posting online. They sent messages through Twitter and WhatsApp. Their stories were eerily similar. For years after that first message came in August, 2018, I messaged refugees and migrants in different Libyan detention centers every day. I imagined the network of hidden phones, the connections between me and them, between them and their families or friends like lifelines, arteries pumping blood. I could not fathom the bravery of the people I spoke to. We talked about the dangers of going public, but if a source wanted to take that risk, I respected their choice. Some were beaten up or tortured on suspicion of sending information. Their phones were regularly confiscated. Still now, I often receive videos, photos, or audio I cannot share. Missing people and evidence of atrocities accumulates in my phone's photo album in between pictures of autumn leaves or friends' babies. I set WhatsApp to save media automatically because detained refugees send me videos they cannot keep for safety reasons, and I do not want to risk them for failing to download. I was getting so many messages at one stage that it was almost impossible to read them all. These images are a sharp reminder of the world's growing disparities. People are more able to communicate than ever before, yet routes to safety are being shut down. Citizens in the West can look away despite windows everywhere, phone screens, TV broadcasts, videos posted online, providing insight into our vast inequality. Anyone who does open their eyes may end up bearing witness to human rights abuses thousands of miles away without any ability to intervene. 70 years after the global refugee system began, we are locking people up for trying to seek safety. We force them out of sight and fortify systems that make it easy for us to forget about them. Some die in captivity and others will be traumatized for life. Sources in Libya tell me all the ways they are treated like animals. They have been flogged, sold, beaten, herded, crammed into holes, into small rooms, even into cages. They have come to despise each other's smells. Their minds slip away, denied the ability to think clearly for so long. They become malleable, forgetting their goals and values. They fret they will never trust again. The hidden side of doing this sort of reporting is how long it takes. Most of the time, I am just chatting to people about themselves, their, their past lives, small daily updates. 
Like the photos on my phone, their messages dart between the mundane and the nightmarish. This book will recount human stories, as well as giving some insight into the systemic issues destroying lives, negligence, corruption, apathy, inequality. It is not a comprehensive account of everything that is happening to people who try to reach Europe, or even to those who are caught by the Libyan Coast Guard. There are new abuses, new humiliations every day, but I hope it plays some role in the quest for accountability. Thank you, Sally. Um, thank you for that. Um, it's, it's such an incredible book that you have written and are sharing um, with the world. It's, um, you know, it's a book that illustrates the complexity in, in the issues around migration and, and refugees. It's around, you know, it's got human rights and dignity and it, it's, you know, politics and policy poverty and health, vulnerability and power, and it starts to show how they're, they're so intrinsically linked. And, you know, I think for all of us reading the book, at times it brought me to tears, the stories of, of, of the people and their, their courage in sharing with you, and other times to frustration at the injustice and, and really had me reflecting on my own lack of knowledge and awareness of what's actually been happening um, along, in your words, the world's deadliest migration route. Um, so, you know, I wonder, would you would you say a little about, you know, why why did you set out to write this book and what exactly were you trying to document? Yeah. Um, so, like I said, kind of there, I actually was contacted at first. I got a Facebook message basically out of nowhere in August 2018 that came from um, a man who had been detained with 500 others. And he said at the time they were in a crisis situation, they had no food, no water, they had been abandoned by the guards who had been um, locking them in for months. But, I, you know, I started chatting to him first, I said, I can't help, you know, I'm a journalist, I'm, I'm not somebody who can, you know, arrange for you to be saved, because I always try and be clear about that, just so that um you know just so so it's clear what my role is but actually I said yeah of course you can talk to me and he started telling me more and more information about how they had got there and and why they were there and what they had been through and it turned out that these 500 people they had tried to cross the Mediterranean Sea to reach Europe to get to safety um but they were intercepted by the Libyan Coast Guard and what has been happening since 2017 is that the EU supports the Libyan Coast Guard to carry out these interceptions in what is actually a deliberate circumnavigation of international law, because a European vessel cannot return people to a country where their life is in danger, but a Libyan vessel can do that. So the EU flies drones, helicopters, planes to spot the boats and then directs the Libyan Coast Guard to them so that they can be intercepted and forced back. So what you have in Libya is many people who are fleeing all sorts of horrific situations, including, you know, wars, dictatorships, um, even, you know, extreme poverty to the extent that it's life threatening, that people can't access health care, for example. And they are in Libya trying to get to Europe where they've heard, you know, this is the bastion of human rights. This is where your human rights will be respected. But instead, they're caught at sea. And since 2017, more than 100,000 men, women and children have been caught and forced back to Libya um, like this. So, so this really shocked me because I realized very quickly that this man that I was, the first man I was in communication with, he was where he was because of European Union migration policy. And therefore he was there in my name. I was complicit in what had happened to them. And I think, I, I mean, I had reported on migration and refugee issues for years at this point, but I didn't actually appreciate that this was happening. I had heard kind of vaguely about it, but I hadn't really realized the actual human repercussions of this policy. And yeah, that's why I think I wrote the book because I just, I basically started gathering so much evidence of what was going on. And I wanted everybody to know about this. I felt that all Europeans, they have to know that this is happening because, um, you know, I don't know, maybe they do stand behind these policies, but it seemed to me that there had been deliberate efforts to silence the voices of the people affected. And I didn't want that to be the case anymore. Mm. 
And Sally, can you say a little bit about, you know, the world's deadliest migration route? Can you say a little bit about where people come from? Because I was really interested just to see all the different nationalities and countries that are coming, for, like you say, for different reasons and end up in Libya trying to get to Europe. Can you just say a little bit about that? Who are yeah. the people that, that, that you were in contact with? Sure. I mean, the world's deadliest migration route, that was what the UN called the Central Mediterranean, I think since 2014. Um, now we're nearly at 20,000 people have drowned, drowned just in this route. So it's kind of from Libya generally to Malta or Italy. Um, and, you know, migration is a bit like someone described it to me as a balloon. You know, you squeeze one part and the other parts expand. So Libya basically has been in a crisis since 2011 when Gaddafi was ousted. And, um, and yeah, the country is like, you know, kind of it's, it's it doesn't have a functional government. It's kind of split between militias. Basically, it has multiple governments. And so that kind of created uh, the ability for people who were desperate to make it to Libya to try and cross from there. And I mean, it's not like it's easy. You know, you get to Libya, you can spend three days in a boat trying to get to Europe. It's a very, very dangerous journey. That's why so many people die. But it was a place that people would go from all sorts of other countries. And so, yeah, you have people from, I mean, the people that I mainly spoke to would actually be recognized generally as refugees if they had the chance to claim that international protection. So part of the issue with refugee law is that you generally have to be on the territory of the country that you want to claim your right to be protected in. So you can't, you know, the, the options for you to travel are very, very limited. You have to actually get there and then you can say, please listen to my claim. I'm a refugee. I've fled, you know, war dictatorships, persecution. And then that will be recognized once you actually arrive. And so you have a lot of people who end up in Libya trying to cross to Europe where they can then claim an internationally recognized right to protection. Right. Um, and so, yeah, the people that I mainly spoke to were from Eritrea, a dictatorship, um, Sudan, obviously a dictatorship and also has war, um, Somalia has war, and also now people are leaving because of the climate change uh, influenced drought, which may be declared a famine this month. Um, and but I spoke to people from all over, you know, Nigerians fleeing poverty, um, Sierra Leoneans fleeing poverty, Gambians as well. Uh, they used to have a dictatorship. Now they also have extreme poverty. Um, uh, people from Yemen, there were people from Yemen there. There were even Syrians there that I spoke to. I don't think any of them are in the book. Um, so yeah, you have people from all, basically all over. Right, right. All kind of all coming together in Libya and all trying to get across that route. Um, I mean, in the book, it's really stark as you describe the conditions um, in the detention centers in, in Libya. And I wonder, you know, you talk about MSF there going in um, and, and a couple of different agencies, but can you talk a little bit about the health conditions for refugees and migrants who, who've been locked up and are still locked up actually in, in the detention centers? Yeah, the health conditions were completely horrific and it did slightly depend on which detention center people were in. I did very much noticed that when MSF was in a detention center, the deaths seemed to go down. Um, and MSF, the way, I, I mean, I don't know, is this is totally coincidental, but they seem to be the only international organization not taking EU money. Um, and there were issues around NGOs going to detention centers, but not actually entering the halls that refugees or detainees were in and not really seeing the health conditions for themselves and going back and making reports saying things that things were OK. Um, MSF did generally enter the halls, and that's, I think, why, uh, you know, partially anyway, why the health conditions improved when they were in somewhere. But yeah, they were horrific and it depends a bit on the detention center, but one detention center I, I write about in the book, Zintan, someone was dying every fortnight of, of basically starvation or tuberculosis. I mean, it would be disease, but, it, but they were being starved. So that obviously plays a big role in weakening their immune system and everything. Um, and yeah, they might get like one roll of bread a day. That might be it. They were all locked in together. They were locked in with people who they knew had tuberculosis, who weren't being treated or diagnosed. They were being denied, uh, you know, the pills they needed. The problem also with TB, if you have the pills you need, but you're not getting food, it's very difficult to take those pills. So 
Um, yeah, that was a big problem. Obviously, uh, pregnancy, like women were giving birth just in the holes without any help. There's one uh, birth that I documented where the other detainees, they put plastic bags on their hands to try and, you know, be sanitary to help this woman give birth. And she basically gave birth in a big hole with hundreds of people inside it. Um, so yeah, like women where I interviewed another woman who's actually based in Ireland now who uh, her baby died and she said she got no health care for nine months before that happened. And she, um, yeah, I think she was eventually given a cesarean, but she said there had been nothing before that, no nutrition. She wasn't being taken care of. And so she didn't think the baby could survive anyway, and it didn't. A lot of the women are victims of rape. They've been with smugglers or traffickers before this. Um, where they've been raped and, and potentially got pregnant. One woman told me that 50% of the pregnant women in detention have are probably, you know, have probably been raped. Um, and yeah, there's, I mean, lots of mental health obviously was a big problem. There was one detention center where I documented one detainee actually killed another after seemingly having like a psychotic episode. And there were, there were detention centers, like a lot of attempted suicides, people would, like detainees would actually tie up other detainees to stop them from killing themselves because they had no other way to take care of them. They were just like, the best we can do is just tie them up, put them in this corner and keep an eye on them. And there's no, you know, there's no care for them. Yeah. Uh, one boy died of appendicitis. I document his story as well because he didn't get health care. The mother tried to get it for him for three days. Um, and then her husband also died. She thinks, I think it was of a stroke uh, or a heart attack, but it was, she thinks it was related to heartbreak, basically, that he was so shocked about how the child had died. Um, so, yeah, I mean, that's just a small sample, but really, you know, really horrific yeah. stories. Yeah, no, they really, they really are. And you, you bring them to life. You know, I think every person that you, um, you include in the book and their story, um, you just, we can really, you can, you can really, it's like we're getting to know the person um, in the, in the way that you document that, um, you know, just in terms of the agencies coming in and out of the, of the d detention centers and just involved in, in, in the whole crisis. I know in the book, particularly you investigate UNHCR, um, you know, IOM a little bit, um, you know, you talk about the EU. I mean, I know it's quite a large part of the book, um, but could you even just briefly say, I mean, what were your findings um, in relation to those organizations and what would you have to say having, you know, having investigated these organizations and their responses as you did? Yeah, I mean, I think I should obviously say, like, it wasn't that I was going out of my way to, you know, to criticize, for example, UNHC or, um, though, interestingly, the way that I actually was contacted at first, and I didn't know about this at the time, I had done an investigation the previous year into UNHC or the UN Refugee Agency in Sudan. And I had reported uh, on allegations that their staff were taking bribes of tens of thousands of dollars from refugees for like legal resettlement. So there's very limited number of legal resettlement slots and the refugees in Sudan and Khartoum were saying that UNHCR staff take bribes basically to decide who will get those slots. And I had reported on that in May, 2018. And two days later, UNHCR suspended resettlement from Sudan. They, they uh, launched an anti-corruption probe and they found one staff member guilty of soliciting bribes and abusing power. But that really like made me start questioning, you know, when we, as a journalist, if I'm reporting on refugees, a lot of the time I would take a UNHCR statement and just report that as fact. And when I reported in Sudan, I started to realize, you know, things are a bit more complex because of course you should be talking to refugees about how they engage. You know, you can't have an organization with a lot of power speaking on behalf of refugees that is also being funded by states. You, you have to also speak to the refugees and, and find their side of this. And um, in Libya, it became very clear very quickly that UNHCR statements, their public statements, were not corresponding with what I was being told by refugees in many different detention centers. And I documented many cases of that. And when I started pointing these out or, or even raising the voices of refugees, I was told by a UNHCR staff member, like, you shouldn't believe what they say. And for me, this was very shocking because 
I first I was like, well, tell me what's wrong, you know, actually tell me what is wrong in my information so that I can understand why you're saying this. And secondly, this was somebody who was in the room with, you know, po top politicians, policymakers and, um, and, you know, was speaking on behalf of refugees in those rooms and yet was telling me we shouldn't believe what refugees say. And this is, you know, people who are in really horrific situations inside detention centers who actually like really, you know, because I was in communication with them every day for years, like they started really appreciating like the importance of accurate information about everything that was going on. And um, I, uh, yeah, so I started looking into it more. It turned out that UNHCR and IOM as well, which is the UN Migration Organization, uh, they receive huge amounts of money from the Trust Fund for Africa, which is the same pot of money that funds the Libyan Coast Guard to do the interceptions. And so there's then money going both to the Libyan Coast Guard and to UNHCR and IOM. And that's money from this pot that is aimed at stopping migration effectively. And, uh, you know, when you interview EU politicians about why are they returning people to it, country where crimes against humanity and war crimes are taking place against them and they're being locked up indefinitely without charge they would say yeah we don't you know it's not great that they're put in indefinite detention but we're trying to improve the situation through UNHCR and IOM and so this was giving the EU a smoke screen and then UNHCR and IOM when they released statements they'd say thank you so much to the EU you're funding our help in detention centers but they wouldn't say that that money had come from the, you know, they wouldn't say that those people were in detention because of EU policy. And so, yeah, I mean, people can read the book if they want right. to get, you know, right. more information on this. Because, yeah. um, but yeah, I basically, it, it's made me question a lot of what I understand about how this whole situation is functioning. And I should say, I mean, this wasn't, I was being contacted a lot by UN staff members who were very uncomfortable. So my sources mm -hmm. weren't just refugees. My sources right. were also many UN staff members who were saying we're, we don't like how this is working. We don't right. feel like we're doing good here. You know, we feel like they were just very, very uncomfortable about the whole situation. Mm, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's quite incredible just being contacted as you were, as you describe it in the book. I mean, the lengths that, that the detainees had to go through to to actually communicate to you the the ways that they had to um you know find the electricity wires to to charge phones to hide phones to hide sim cards um i mean it's a very unusual kind of reporting that you were doing and it must have you know i, I imagined as i was reading it how much of your life was was filled with messages coming in from from people i mean how what was that like the you know that kind of reporting coming in messages coming in from from you know sometimes new people sometimes people i i can see from the book you developed relationships with over years yeah I mean it was very intense mm -hmm. especially the first I'd say two years um and the thing was because most people message at night so you won't actually you know throughout the day you might not get that many contacts but then around 11 because everybody's hiding you know the guards might be not be there anymore they're hiding under blankets or it's dark um, people will start messaging you and that would go on till maybe 3 a.m. And so every night I'd be, you know, thinking maybe I'll go to sleep. And then suddenly it's just true. I denied. And of course, you have to respond. And they, people were just sending me. We kind of built up a system where people would just send me updates. You know, here's what happened today. Anything you should know. A lot of my job became passing on information to NGOs and, and organizations rather than making it public. So we, I tend to pass on information first and see did something happen. And then we decide to go public if it didn't. Um, and yeah, it was very intense. And at the same stage, I mean, I did an event actually recently with an ex UNHCR staff member because I was thinking, you know, I'm always thinking like, did I like, like, why was I being contacted so much? Because my number was passed around many different detention mm -hmm. centers. Um, and she was saying that actually the organizations that were, you know, charged with helping they potentially deliberately didn't have a method of communication between their staff and detainees because they felt like they might be overwhelmed, for example. So um, they would be communicating just with the management of the detention centers who obviously had an incentive not to tell the truth. So when I got involved with it, it was like suddenly there's somebody that we can tell everything to. And right. yeah, it was it was a lot. I mean, I say that it, I was obviously 
I'm glad that I did it, but that's yeah. why I wrote the book because so much right. I couldn't publish at the time for right. the safety of sources. Yeah. Um, but I wanted to put it all together. Yeah, and the safety, I mean, you talk about the safety of sources and even the safety for yourself. I mean, you faced death threats yourself. You were put under criminal investigation while you were doing this reporting. Um, and still, this issue is not getting as much attention as, as you would expect. I mean, it's so, it's so shocking when you read the details as you report, you report on them in the book. I mean, what was it like? One one part that really struck me was when um, SA, for example, who was a, a kind of a constant... Um, a constant um, source for you, and and I'm sure a friend. Um, by 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 the end of that, uh, when you when you actually met him for for real, when he had arrived in, um, I think it was was it Malta or Italy for him, he had arrived there, and you met him for the first time. And uh, what was that like meeting people like I say, the brave people who had been, you know, who had risked their lives to send information out. You know, it, it was very strange to be honest, because um, even in my head, I was thinking like can this be real? You know, so many things that were happening were so horrific. And my role in it, normally I would travel to a place where I'm reporting on. I couldn't go to Libya for security reasons. I actually tried a lot to get a visa and that also was denied. But um, but I had I had security, like I re received security warnings about my safety too. Um, so I couldn't go there. But I, uh, yeah, I was always kind of thinking maybe this is still, I mean, I gathered the evidence, I was triangulated everything, I did absolutely everything I should do to verify, but still somewhere in your head, you're like, maybe it's not real, or maybe I just imagined this, or like, how could, you know, how could this horror be ongoing, and I just become like a part of it, and um, yeah, when I met him, that was really, it really was both incredible, but also very strange. We talked for, I think the first day we met, we talked for about 10 hours, just nonstop, just remember this, remember this, what was happening here, what was happening here, like, you know, and that was when he told me, for example, that they used to have these gatherings um with like literally hundreds of people in this detention center and he would actually read out what I had said to all these detainees like they'd kind of say you know any updates from Sally and he'd read if I had said something and I had not been aware of that at the time so I was I, I'm glad I didn't know that at the time actually because from my perspective I was just like chatting with someone online and suddenly you're like what this is having a kind of much larger implication which you know I I couldn't have really comprehended um but it was amazing and I'm glad that he's he's still doing well and I met his family as well I mean in uh, Ethiopia that was lovely but um but it's hard a lot I've met a lot of people now even more yes. than since the book came out yes. and they're all struggling in many different ways and yeah. at the same stage like you know, you have to celebrate lots of small successes. Yeah. Lots of people have jobs or, you know, yeah. they've, yeah, very yeah. things going on. Yeah, and even all throughout, um, you know, it's like no matter what the conditions and what what's going on, there is this element of hope and of ne never giving up on on the dream of something better for themselves and and their families, which is just um, which is really, you know, this uh, a theme in this conference. Uh, today's theme, actually, it's actually tomorrow's theme in the conference is around resilience, you know, around resilience, and I think this book um, really shows resilience in. Um, in a way that that uh, that most things cannot. Um, I mean, Sally, you're speaking to the global health community in Ireland. Um, you know, there that means you're speaking to NGOs, you're speaking to universities, you're speaking to media journalists here, our health service, wonderful health professionals across the country. What can and should they be doing about this situation? Um, because it's still ongoing today. What would your key messages for for them and for all of us be? Yeah, I mean, I get asked this a lot. Uh, to be honest, I'm, you know, I work as a journalist. I'm not necessarily like a activist or advocate or anything like this, but I do think that everybody needs to be informed about what's going on and, and needs to be questioning themselves. Like, are they okay with this? Like, we are all complicit in this as long as it happens. Um, and yeah, I mean, in terms of healthcare, I guess the people watching are going to understand a lot more than others what I'm speaking about when I say, you know, that it's shocking that people are locked inside with, with you know, others with tuberculosis or that there are children who are dying because they have appendicitis. Like, I think that that, you know, it's, it's harrowing and it's happening in our names and 
everybody needs to know about it and yeah then maybe they can question what they can do um and i guess the other would be you know challenging the ngos as well i mean maybe challenging is the wrong word but you know ngos do play a role in situations like this particularly when they're taking government funding and when they're interacting with governments and it's pretty clear in my book that um you know that that the ngos were playing some sort of active role in whatever way you want to interpret that and i think that that probably is something that also needs to be at least questioned we all need to be questioning ourselves every day and i say this i'm questioning myself you know in the book i think it's clear i'm also questioning my role in this pretty constantly um so yeah i hope that people will read the book uh my first time we drowned yeah this is the book, um, an absolutely incredible book, an incredible read. And, you know, in terms of taking a first step to do something um, and, you know, read the book, like you say, Sally, read the book. Um, it's caused me to question myself very much. And, uh, you know, what can I do? And I think it always starts with, you know, like you, you've really shown us what's possible when one person, you know, says, what can I do and just responds. Um, and I think that's it's a challenge for all of us to do the same thing. And um, so we're going to we're going to open the floor and thank you for joining uh, us from Sierra Leone, where you are, and, and just see what other questions um, we have from the floor. So um, thank you, Sally. I'm going to go over to the questions. Thank you.